two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi. That's ten Mississippis. That's got to be ten. How is everybody this evening? Great. Okay, great. I appreciate you all coming. I don't know if any of you have been on the 210 West, but it is an absolute nightmare. Uh, car is overturned, and I feel somewhat exceptional being able to make it here. Um, I traveled from San Diego, so just to, to give you an idea, and um, by way of introduction, my name is Morgan Appel, and I am the director of the education department at UC San Diego Extended and Professional Programs. And I am also an instructor in our gifted and talented programs, as well as um, in an administrative services credential program at UC Irvine. So um, we've been working with teachers uh, in Pasadena for, for probably the last year or so. And um, I don't, have any, any of you seen me before? OK. So you know that I've also um, worked with parents. Um, and it's really been my pleasure. Uh, you know, Pasadena Unified is like a second home to me. Um, and you know, that's why I'm so very happy to be able to, to make the trip up here, even though it can prove frustrating. So um, you all know Huri Chalian? Familiar with her? Uh, she uh, runs the gifted and talented programs as well as some others here. And we were talking about programs that uh, might be of interest to parents, sort of beyond the typical things we've discussed before. And she mentioned that twice exceptionality was something that you were very much interested in. Um, so I'm very happy to, to talk to you about it tonight. And I hope you will feel free. We're a small enough group where something you want to ask about or something you want clarification about, I hope you'll free just to stop me uh, right here in the middle. And um, what's interesting about twice exceptionality is that the, the topics embedded within uh, special education learning disabilities and gifted and talented education are both in their own right very complex and um, somewhat ambiguous in, in defining and somewhat complex in their diagnosis. So I was very happy that you wanted to, to tackle this subject. So let me talk to you a little bit about um, what, what we'll do. Um, we've covered introductions. Um, I'm sure I will meet all of you separately at some time. Um, but I wanted to uh, talk to you also about the socio-emotional characteristics of the gifted and talented with a focus on the characteristics of twice exceptionality. Because really, that's where the rubber meets the road. And there's some very distinguishing characteristics that you'll see. Um, give you a better sense of what it means to be dual or twice exceptional. Um, we also, you may hear the term 2E. Uh, which is also that. Um, looking at understanding giftedness and learning disability, um, looking at the special cases of being gifted and ADD and ADHD, how teachers attempt to work with uh, dual exceptionality, and what you as parents can do. Um, and what I will be doing um, when I return home to San Diego, if the roads permit, I'll be sending uh, Huri and the, the department here a list of resources that you can easily access online focused specifically on this. So you will have my contact information at the end of this presentation. And I want you to feel free to send me an email and say, well, I need a particular resource on this, or I have questions about that, and I can locate that for you. Among us, we have a large number of people who are twice exceptional. Um, and they include some people that you may know. George Washington, first president of the United States. Now, I don't know how they exactly they diagnosed it, but I uh, believe that they found him. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, another president. Nelson Rockefeller, Rocky, the governor of New York. Jay Leno, 
Henry Winkler, Stephen Hawking, Thomas Edison, Leonardo da Vinci. I was almost going to say Leonardo DiCaprio, which is something a little different. Um, Pablo Picasso, Albert Einstein, John Nash, you may remember John Nash, played by Russell Crowe in the movie A Beautiful Mind. Um, Winston Churchill, Alexander Graham Bell, Patricia Polanco, who is a, you know, a very famous author. And estimates uh, within the research and within anecdotal experience tell us that about 2 to 5 percent of identified gifted students are thought to have learning disabilities. So if you are twice exceptional, you are in fairly good company. So let's take a look at some of the socio-emotional characteristics of giftedness, and we can look at how uh, the twice exceptional fare among. Now I know this may be a little bit hard for you to see on the PowerPoint, um, and I'll um, make sure that, that you have a better copy. But what you have here is a listing of conventional characteristics and then separate it out by culturally and linguistically diverse, low socioeconomic, and twice exceptional. Now, you'll probably find that a lot of these tend to overlap, but when we look at some of these characteristics, you can see some distinguishing factors. So, for example, we look at the ability to learn basic skills quickly and retain information with less repetition. Well, one of the things that we know about twice exceptionality is much of the issues that they face are processing disorders. And if you um, had been in attendance at my brain compatible learning session, you'll know that that happens up in the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is where we take information from various sources, touch, sound, sight, smell, and auditory information, and make it whole. So what we find is that due to some of these processing difficulties, a lot of the twice exceptional students have trouble mastering basic skills, the metacognitively based process skill. When we talk about characteristics of traditional gifted, we often talk about high verbal ability, a rich and robust vocabulary. What we do find with twice exceptionality, one of the defining characteristics, is high verbal ability but difficulty in written language, meaning that it's harder for them to take what is in their head, what they can say, and put it onto paper. Um, you know, some will use uh, inappropriate types of language uh, in written form. Early reading ability, again, because of cognitive processing issues, that may not show up in twice exceptional. Um, keen powers of observation. What we find in the case of twice exceptionality is you find kids who have very strong observation skills, meaning that they can go in front of something and describe it in a uh, wonderfully colorful way, but when they turn away from it, they cannot recall it. Um, so the deficit really is in memory. Uh, you find generally in traditional gifted and talented strong critical thinking and problem solving decision making skills. Well, for kids who are twice exceptional, usually this will extend to solving what we call real world problems. Those uh, issues that make us street smart, the common sense issues. Um, and they have fantastic thinking and decision-making skills that allow them to compensate for whatever learning disability that they may have. In traditional gifted and talented, although I will somewhat disagree with that, um, is the idea that they have a long attention span and persistent intense concentration. In the case of twice exceptionality, you may find that these are students that have attention deficit problems and difficulty concentrating for long periods of time, except in areas that they're interested in. And what you'll find typically in twice exceptionality 
is that they have one very specific area of focus that they are intensely drawn to. But as you know about the candle that burned brightly, it also peters out quickly. So one of the problems that teachers encounter with twice exceptional kids is that they focus all of their energies on one thing that they're interested in. So you say, let's say you have a kid, all they're interested in is horses, okay? They have pictures of ponies, they have pony tails, they have pony cars, everything is sort of um, an equine-centric field of interest. And everything, you know, you can't get, and so it's detrimental to any other areas of interest. So a good and thoughtful and ardent teacher will develop what we would say would be a horse-centric curriculum, okay? So you, for math, you would focus on how much feed you have to buy for a horse. Um, for uh, art, you know, you would focus on sort of these wonderful pictures of horses and jumping. But what you find is by the time that this is all developed and all put into place, the interest has changed to something else equally as intense. So what you have is kids who pay very intense attention to the stuff that they're interested in. And that's compatible with the physiology and chemistry of the brain. Traditional gifted, you will find a questioning attitude. And those of you um, who have kids who are gifted know that they question everything. Um, the difference is that with twice exceptionality, the questioning becomes somewhat aggressive uh, to the point where it may be inappropriate or disrespectful and pestering, right? Kids who won't let it go. Um, you find with traditional gifted, creative in the generation of thoughts, ideas, actions, and innovation. In twice exceptionality, we take this and magnify it exponentially, where you find unusual imagination, bizarre ideas that, that are, are fantastic and marvelous and compelling, but really far afield. You find that um, gifted and talented tend to take risks. I would um, somewhat disagree with it. I think that the gifted and talented traditionally tend to take risks in the classroom. They take academic risks. Social risks are harder. What you will find with twice exceptionality, they are very hesitant to take the same type of academic risks that their traditionally gifted counterparts um, because they are trying to mask or compensate for whatever learning disability they have. And while they have the sort of perfectionist attitude and perspective of a traditionally gifted child, there is also um, a, a really s uh, a sense of uh, not wanting to be exposed and a uh, sense of self-preservation. Uh, in gifted kids, as you know, you will find unusual and highly developed senses of humor. Okay, what do I mean by that? Anybody? You all have kids who are gifted. What do I mean by an unusual sense of humor? Every, you all are not. Uh, 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 uh. What do I mean by that? Uh, and, and, you, and you can imagine that the humor with these kids is a lot more sophisticated. It's more uh, verbal over visual, especially at an early age. Um, what the twice exceptional kid will use humor for is to divert attention from their own failures in the classroom or in school. So they become the class clown and use that sort of behavior to distract from what areas of deficit they have, right? So they're very good at something, and that's being funny and making everybody laugh. Giftedness is defined by, typically, by asynchrony. What do I mean? What's asynchrony? Anybody want to wager a guess? Those of you who have seen me before, what's asynchrony? What does it mean to be in sync?
It absolutely does. So what we know about human development, child development, is that for every year you grow physically, you should grow a year cognitively, and you should grow a year social emotionally. Now, some of us petered out on the physical growth, at least the height growth, probably in sixth grade, as you can plainly see. Um, but when we talk about asynchrony, what we're talking about is that human development is out of sync. When we talk about gifted kids, we're talking about kids who grow a year physically, cognitively may grow three years, but even may regress a year social emotionally. And what we find is that they do mature at different rates than their age peers, but in different ways. Um, with twice exceptionality, what you will find that that gets a, a, a little bit wonky because you will find that the twice exceptional kids are the ones who appear the most immature and use anger and, and crying and withdrawal to express feelings um, with uh, some difficulty. Whereas uh, with maybe the traditional gifted or high achievers, um, they have uh, better control. And that really has to also do with brain development. When you look at the development of the prefrontal cortex that controls our emotions versus the limbic system, which um, you know, uh, brings our emotions to the forefront. Now, one of the things I want to tell you about are adolescents. Are any of you parents of adolescents? Will any of you? Yeah, you have to. Yeah. OK, never mind. At some point, you will all be parents of teenagers. And what do you know about teenagers? Their frontal lobes are a mess, because what you will find is that there are two times in the human growth cycle where your prefrontal lobes, you just want to avoid them, OK? Because they're growing like crazy, and uh, that is the part of the brain that gives you good decision making, uh, judgment, rational thought, uh, control over emotions, those kinds of things. Anybody want to wager? You know when one of them is going to be teens. When else is it all messed up? You know when it is. You probably passed it already. Terrible twos, terrible teens. Okay, and what we know about that period of of um, physical growth is that is the period when the limbic system that produces emotions outpaces the prefrontal cortex that controls them. So all of the eye rolling, uh, though I don't know if any of you are middle school teachers or parents of middle schoolers, but you know that the, the life of the middle schooler is eye rolling, size, and drama, right? Everything is a crisis, you know? I didn't get fries, I got onion rings instead, and it's the end of the world. Um, now, I don't want to say that eye rolling and sighing is exclusive to teenagers. Believe me, I sit in faculty meetings, and I shouldn't even need these with all the exercise my eyes get. But in, in speaking in defense of adolescents, even though it is their fault, it's not really their fault. It's their brain's fault. Um, but what you should know, those of you who have kids who are on that pathway, you think it's bad now. Now, if you have a gifted and talented kid or a twice exceptional kid, all of the great stuff that you get with puberty and adolescence is going to be magnified times three. So get ready. Being gifted is like the El Nino of emotions. So be prepared because it, it, it's coming down. Um, but what you will see is that while gifted kids tend to try to control their emotions, it is the twice exceptional kids who react with greater intensity. Uh, gifted kids traditionally have a sense of independence. You probably know that by now. Twice exceptional kids, um, in contrast, especially in the classroom, require constant feedback and constant support all the time. So generally, in general, gifted kids are uh, what we call autodidactic learners, meaning that you know, they have a good, a good idea of how they learn. They like to learn independently. And as a teacher, you know, the, what you're good for is the bathroom key and to verify that I've been here all day. 
With twice exceptional kids, what lies within the gifted, sort of the looking outwardly for approval and inwardly for blame, gets magnified. And they do feel as though the spotlight is on them all the time. So if you take, let's say, a simple, simple assignment from my day, what I did over the summer. Um, up until I was 18, we had that essay, write a five paragraph essay about what I did over the summer. Traditional gifted kid will say, got it, good, come back, you know, five minutes later, you know, you have a, a 1,200 page novel about summer. It's like a summer play. With twice exceptional kids, what you will find is that they will pen what I did this summer. Come over to the teacher. Is this what you mean? Is this okay? You'll go, no, that's great. Keep going. Write a sentence. Come back. Is this okay? So that need for approval, especially in the deficit area, is pronounced and, and very manifest. Um, sometimes they will seem very independent. If it's an area that they're interested in and if it's an area of strength, you'll see independence. In others, you will see a need for immediate and constant approval. And in others, you will see a stubborn disregard. I don't need to do this. I don't want to do this. I won't do this. So I think you're getting sort of a picture of what this looks like. Um, and what winds up happening are those contrary behaviors become ambiguous to educators. So we're trying to figure out you know, is this kid, um, you know, learning disabled? Is this kid gifted? Is this kid none of the above? Because the signs are unclear. Traditional ki gifted kids are thought of as sensitive. Um, you know, uh, they are naturally empathetic. Um, you know, I think we all know um, if we've watched late night television, you will see these commercials where animals are in cages, right? And there's a woman singing a song, right? And you're sitting next to your dog, and your dog's looking at you, and you're looking at your dog, and they're going over, you know, in puppy mills, and, and you're starting to tear up. And that's the typical course of the gifted kid, that kind of depth of empathy. Um, what you will find um, with twice exceptionality is you will find the same degree or more intensive sensitivity, but only in, in certain areas. They tend to be very, very self-critical. Um, they tend to be critical of their teachers if they aren't getting it. Um, and uh, they will often act out uh, in antisocial ways more as a defensive mechanism than anything else. Because can Concealing a learning difficulty, a learning disability, especially if you are in the company of traditionally gifted kids, takes a lot of work. It is uh, emotionally exhausting. Um, we know that uh, gifted kids sometimes are not necessarily accepted into the social circles of others. Um, we also know that they sort of feel that sometimes they have um, not a great way of reading the room, as it were, um, when we talk about emotional intelligence. Um, it's even more difficult for twice exceptional kids because you have a kid who has a diagnosed learning disability and who's identified gifted and really doesn't fit completely in either sphere. Um, so um, they also may have some difficulty being accepted because they tend to be very vocal, sometimes antisocial, and very stubborn. Um, traditional gifted, you see a good uh, exhibit of leadership ability. Um, when we talk about twice exceptional kids, um, you will see that same kind of organic leadership ability but it is of what we'd call the non-traditional students. That sort of ragged band of misfits has to have a leader. And, and probably this is the kid that's leading them. Gifted kids tend to have a wide range of interests. And um, I, I would somewhat disagree with that. I think gifted kids tend to have a wide range of interests, but obsess 
Uh, and I think you'll see that part of giftedness feels like obsessive compulsive um, behaviors, a lot of them generally. What you will find is um, that because of the, the cognitive, uh, the, the learning processing issues, it's difficult for twice exceptional kids to engage a wide range of interests, which is one of the reasons for a very focused area of interest. Um, we know from the physiology of the brain and sort of the emotional stamp on the brain that we are drawn to things that we like to learn because it causes a chemical reaction. Um, and we are rewarded for engaging uh, those things. But with twice exceptionality, it tends to be very, very focused, almost like a laser, very hot, very burning, and uh, very intense. Um, we also see uh, that traditional gifted have very focused interests. Um, but when we talk about twice exceptionality, often we're talking about interests that lie outside of the school. So you can see why it might be a little bit confusing. Um, because we see signs of, of giftedness. We see signs of talent. But we're not 100% sure. Which speaks very powerfully to some of these points. This is how we see twice exceptionality in the classroom. Generally, there's a sort of a lack of awareness. Um, interestingly, you'll find that when we look at gifted and talented education and the resources provided therein, it is usually under the domain of special education. And you will have special education that encompasses everything from highly gifted um, to mild to moderate, uh, to um, learning handicapped and other things. So it's uh, a special ed issue. You will find above average achievement, but with very pronounced learning difficulties in certain areas. Um, that high achievement might serve to mask the actual learning disability. Because twice exceptional kids develop phenomenal coping mechanisms phenomenal methods of concealment, and phenomenal methods of moving forward. How do we not see them? We might see struggling students and diagnose them as learning disabled. And that disability masks the giftedness. So we only see the learning disability and not the giftedness. If we see just average achievement, what we see is the giftedness and the learning disability yielding a zero net effect. That the learning disability and the giftedness effectively cancel one another out to yield average achievement. So neither part is served. What we will also see are students who love to learn but hate school. Right? You know, they're sitting at home, they're watching TV, they're watching the History Channel, you know, they're watching all of those things. You know, they're reading books, but they can't stand school. Um, for, for the structures, for the evaluation, all of that kind of thing. Um, and teachers just have a lot of difficulty understanding these kids because things will change rapidly. And once you think you got it, well, guess what? You don't got it. We see kids who have an advanced oral vocabulary but difficulty with the written word. We see bright children who are difficult. And by difficult, that means they're disruptive behaviorally. They are class clowns. They are troublemakers. They're riling everybody up. And, and you think, if you could only take these same energies and apply them to school, but it's not that easy. They master math concepts easily, but have trouble with computation. They get the abstract stuff. You know, they get the advanced calculus. They get the theory. They get the you know, beautiful mind stuff. But the basic computation. Now, one of the other issues here is that how, well, let me ask you this. What's half of 2 times 3? OK. So you all guys here just went 3, which me, and, and not, I mean, you didn't really sound like 3, but you got it immediately. And what you will see in gifted and talented kids that the answers tend to come like that, without thinking about it. 
Now, if you ask me what is half of 2 times 3, well, I grew up in the 1970s under the new math. So I would say 1 half equals 0 0.5. 0 0.5 equals 1 over 2 times 3 over 1, which is a subset of an ordinal numeral. And about two months later, I would come out with 3. <laughs> now, where do gifted kids run into problems where the answers just come? Where do you run into problems? When the, when the teacher says, OK, yeah, how did you get that? And they're like, what does it matter? <laughs> My got it. Gifted kids love to write, but they hate to edit or be edited. Right? They don't like punctuation. They don't like capital letters. They don't like being told um, you know, that it's not good enough. Uh, you, know, you need to use a period every now and then. Right? The way I wanted to say it's the way it came out, and, and that's it. Now, when we talk about mathematics, there is a field of mathematics where it says you've got to prove it, right? It's not enough to say angle A is cuter than angle B or whatever the, <laughs> I'm not a mathematician, obviously, but geometry requires proofs. Don't just say it because it looks like it. You've got to prove it. Um, so what you will find is that gifted kids, where the answers come organically, they get into trouble anyway. Twice exceptional, it's even harder for them because gifted kids can usually backtrack and pick up the methods and, and make you happy. Um, now, another part of asynchrony that we're talking about um, not only relates to human development, cognitive, physical, and emotional development, but you will see the asynchronous development between strengths and weaknesses within one person. So you, like, for example, in mathematics, you will see them excel in certain areas of advanced mathematics, but not be able to do them uh, with the basic stuff. So their weaknesses develop sometimes at a quicker rate than do their strengths. It throws things off balance. Um, and you know how people find out? Their kids are twice exceptional, how teachers find out? Generally, when talking with you guys. Because, you know, the teacher is, is bewildered because, first of all, um, a long time ago, long, long time ago in the 1990s, we used to have self-contained gifted classrooms. So every kid in the class would be gifted and teachers had sort of advanced certifications and gifted and talented education and really had a good understanding. Nowadays, that's, that's not true. We, we exist in what we call the mixed or multiple ability classrooms. So you have a teacher who's dealing with very broad spectrum of different types of issues, and usually they are not prepared to um, you know, look at the finer points of gifted and talented education like twice exceptionality, although it's more prevalent than people think. So what do we mean when we say giftedness? Now, one of the things that you should know is that this is the government's definition of giftedness. One of the problems with gifted and talented education, identifying gifted and talented students, and serving gifted and talented students is that the expert researchers cannot come to a common definition of what it means to be gifted. There's some overlap in definitions. There's some overlap in researchers. But really, we don't know if it's a, a, a donkey, or if it's a horse, or if it's a hippo. But it's got four legs, right? Um, so if you need clarity, the best entity to turn to is the government. The government will tell you, well, this is what it is. And what the government's definition, according to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, are students, children, or youth who give evidence of achievement capability in areas such as intellectual, creative, artistic, or leadership capacity, or in specific academic fields. And basically, the state of California parrots that. that that's, those are the areas that we can identify in. And who need services or activities not ordinarily provided by the school. So basically what that says is these are specific traits that these kids have, and you've got to treat them, serve them a bit differently. 
Now that comes from ed code. Learning disabilities, okay, so that's the one half of twice exceptionality is giftedness. Learning disabilities comes from the idea of 2004, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And the way that they define, again, the government definition are specific learning disabilities, speech or language impairments, emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, orthopedic impairments, physical uh, disabilities, visual impairments, or other health impairments. When we talk about twice exceptionality, what we're talking about are those two things coming together, okay? And you can see, you know, let's say you, when we're trying to identify giftedness and we are using a um, written test that looks at reading comprehension. What if you're dyslexic, right? What if you are academically gifted and creative in the English language but dyslexic and you get a test that, um, you know, looks at reading comprehension? Well, guess what? You will probably not be identified based on that test. Now, this district uses a battery called the Raven, which is the sort of state of the art. It's, it's a nonverbal inventory um, which has been tested globally. But again, identification is an art. Um, and given ultimate resources and um, you know, unlimited time and unlimited patience, we could do a fine job of identifying every kid who's gifted. But we do have limited fiscal resources and limited uh, you know, uh, talent resources. So let's say if you are trying to identify a gifted kid in the area of drama or visual art, well, here in Pasadena, you will probably find somebody who can evaluate a portfolio. I bet I could throw a rock and hit some of these. You want somebody to evaluate performing arts? Go to Hollywood. Anybody, ask your server, they could probably do it for you. But if you're in Barstow, and this is no knock on anybody who's from Barstow, who made the trip out from Barstow today, but you know, if you're in a remote or rural area, it's hard to get those types of resources. And they are not inexpensive either. So there's always a balance. It's hard enough to identify gifted kids, let alone twice exceptional kids. Children who are both gifted and learning disabled are called twice exceptional or 2E because their abilities lie outside the norms at both ends of the bell curve. And these kids are immensely diverse and embody every imaginable combination of strengths and weaknesses. Now imagine you're, you're you know, teaching third grade and trying to figure all of this out. Um, what are some of the assets and challenges? Well, when we look at these kids, the assets look like this. Creativity. Some of the most, remember the list I showed you guys? You can't tell me that those were not creative people. Thinking ability. Long-term memory. Now, short-term memory tends to be a problem. Okay, the parietal problems usually involve short-term memory. Um, abstraction, they are phenomenal at abstraction because their minds can sort of expand. Um, problem solving, insight, sophistication. Um, interestingly, the research says that the presence of the disability might also enhance the giftedness because what winds up happening is you have to work harder to fight the effects of the, the disability and become more creative in the process. It's a phenomenally interesting thing. Some of the challenges, appropriate self-expression. When we talk about gifted kids being intense and intensive, we're talking about twice exceptionality as a magnification of this quality. Organizational skills and study skills. Now what you will find um, traditionally gifted are really bad at study skills and being organized. Um, high achievers, on the other hand, are high achievers because they do have those skills. Um, and usually for gifted and twice exceptional, when things come naturally, why bother studying if you got the answer? What's the point? 
Um, but what we find is that some of the organizational skills um, for twice exceptional tend to really falter, and that's also because of the processing. Short-term memory, um, sense perception, easily distracted, okay? Um, you know, you'll see this in attention deficit disorder, um, ADHD, but distractibility. Um, and, and it's not just being distracted, the senses are more pronounced. So these are kids who can hear mosquitoes, you know, five miles away, and it's distracting them. Um, social interaction can be a real challenge. Um, Self-esteem uh, can be a problem. Uneven academic abilities. So one week you'll see these kids shine. They are absolutely stellar. Um, and the next week it will seem as though it's, it's a different kid altogether. Biggest uh, issue is what we call moving from head to paper. And I think that we have all had that at one time where you say, I, I got it up here. I just can't get it down here, right? Um, a lot, and you, where does that happen frequently, do you think? Tests, Tests absolutely. So, you know, these are kids who are, you know, phenomenal. They got the stuff in their long-term memory. They're ready to go. But when the test is in front of them, you know, it's almost like the paper lifts off and, you know, it's very difficult for them to get from here to here. Again, that's going to mask uh, ability. Auditory or visual problems, as we've said before. As I mentioned before, all of this, you're going to see uh, this during adolescence. Now, you're going to see this in gifted and talented kids times three and twice exceptional kids times nine. Um, they experience a lot of frustration with brain-to-body control, meaning if they, if they can't get it out, if they, if they can't say what they want to say, they are, are, you know, they'll grip themselves, uh, uh, things like that. You'll see a lot of humility, almost uh, an, an apologetic at times. Unusual persistence, which makes sense. The, the gifted part of them creates that sort of hyper-perfectionism, that drive to move forward and do it right. So this is part of their coping skills and overcoming skills. You know, they, they perhaps aren't getting things well, but that drive that lives within the gifted part of them makes them persist and move forward. These are kids. Now, gifted kids generally have trouble bumping up against the educational system because the educational system, as you know, got started really uh, in, in earnest during the Industrial Revolution, and the idea was to prep kids for factory work, doing detailed, repetitive, highly structured, segmented work. Gifted kids generally don't blend in well with that system. With twice exceptional kids, it's even worse because they may be trying like crazy just to get through the day, but their teachers perceive them as being lazy or not dedicated or not paying attention. So those early memories of schooling, those long-term memories, make the schooling experience bad. And what you will find uh, about the brain chemistry is that when we are put in those types of situations, have any of you had negative feedback of any kind ever? Never, never. We're all perfect, right? Um, what? How did you feel? Like, if let's say you're you, you're at work and you get a negative comment or negative feedback. What happens to you physically? You feel it in your gut, right? And your heart starts to flutter. All of that. There's two chemicals being generated, um, and those two chemicals put us our brains into what we call survival mode, the fight or flight mode that goes all the way back to our most primitive selves. And those chemicals are adrenaline, I'm sure you're all familiar with that one, and cortisol. And cortisol basically makes the brain hyper-focused to the detriment of anything else. So all of the logical processing shuts down so we can pay 
hyperattention. So that's why when you receive negative feedback or adrenaline is coursing through your brain, you're not making logical decisions. You're focused on just getting through it. Well, those chemicals have a lasting impact. Um, and it's very easy to trigger that same kind of feeling again. So um, if you've had negative experiences with the education system on a persistent basis, you, you are going to have that negative chemistry associated. Um, you'll find that these kids are very stubborn and very obstinate at times. Um, that also comes from persistence. Their street smarts sometimes do not translate into the classroom environment. Very, very sensitive to criticism. Very, very impulsive. Unusually intense. And again, can use humor to distract from them. Gifted kids always feel as though they're in the spotlight. Now imagine if you're in the spotlight because of a learning deficit. You want to swing it away to focus on anything else. So you're going to use humor, and you may even use bullying to get the spotlight off of you. Now, let me ask you this. Can you see why this might be confusing to teachers? Let's say a teacher has a class of 40, and sort of you have this kid who kind of does well sometimes, who's nice sometimes, who's, you know, um, seems a bit off other times, and you're really not sure. You know, some people will say, well, this is a gifted kid. You know, he's sensitive. But sometimes you may not see it. So teachers have a lot of difficulty with twice exceptionality, especially when you, you yield a zero net effect. Now you're just thinking you have an average kid who has a behavior problem. So they're not getting any kind of support. But when they do, um, there is uh, a, a good way to focus. And if um, you, you know twice exceptional kids, or you work with them, or you want to support them, here are some of the things that you can work with teachers at doing. One is to use a strengths-based approach. These kids are strong in certain areas, and those are the areas that are going to drive them forward. Many times in education, we try to focus on rectifying weaknesses instead of focusing on strengths. What we know about brain chemistry is that a little success goes a long way. In biblical phraseology, success begat success. And um, one of the ways that you can promote success with twice exceptional kids who may have trouble with long-term, big, complex projects is to chunk it out, to let them experience success in little bites so it can grow. Um, can use an interdisciplinary and relevant curriculum. I think with Common Core State Standards and some of the gifted curriculum that we're using here at Pasadena, we're doing that. We, we want to make things integrated. We want to make things relevant. Teach the way that people learn. Again, that's part and parcel of gifted and talented education. That's the whole idea behind differentiated instruction, to meet learners where they are and to build upon that rather than just saying, well, you got to try harder, right? You know, if you're not getting it the way I'm teaching it, it's because you're not trying hard enough, OK? So we're just going to, during the 1990s, under No Child Left Behind, that's what we did. We said, well, um, you know, we're going to do math and language arts blocks. And if you're not getting it, well, then we're just going to keep hammering you until you do. That doesn't work emotionally, and that doesn't work physiologically. Um, teaching process-related strategies that help with weaknesses. Somebody is having difficulty with computation, then you find a way that's process-oriented to help them with that. Scaffolding just means to build upon what we know, to use the experience and expertise of the kid who comes to you and build on that rather than point to putting them in an unfamiliar environment. Teaching strategies, effort and process equals success. How do we usually determine success in the classroom? How do we know kids are successful? What do we evaluate? We use grades. We evaluate the work. We say, OK, you got an A on this. Uh, you did a, a good job. The final product is wonderful. We always evaluate 
product, but not the process by which we get product. And we know with twice exceptionality, praising process, giving kudos for trying, because remember, these are kids who are trying their hearts out every day, every day just to get through. Lending credence to that is very important. Um, attending to pacing, which also means not focusing exclusively on weaknesses. Where you see a kid is doing something uh, very well and knows his stuff, then squish that curriculum down and let them build on that. And where they need more help, put more time there. Don't assume that you have to pace instruction at the same pace that you're doing with everybody else. Um, you have to look for a teaching fit. And that's hard for teachers because you have 40 other kids in the classroom and um, you can't build an individualized curriculum for everybody. Although with technology, it's very much possible. So you can take these kids and you can find a fit. You can tap into their interests. And never take time away from strengths to focus on weaknesses because the, the cognitive and the emotional impacts of doing so are going to yield the opposite effect. Um, some other things uh, that, that you can do. Um, specific instruction in organization, and that's good for gifted kids too. Tell them about how to be organized. To the extent possible, give them a choice where they can work within the classroom. This doesn't mean have them get up and walk around and throw somebody out of a desk or what have you, but some, they're very space sound and sight sensitive. So sometimes where they are, it's just impossible for them to get something done. So to the extent possible, you want to provide that kind of latitude. Um, meta skills, time and self-management. Um, focusing on experiential learning, which means not just delivering content, but to value and lend credence to experiences. Um, afford, uh, afford broader choice in product, meaning there's one, more than one way you can showcase knowledge. It doesn't always have to be a paper. It doesn't always have to be an exam. And these kids, as we know, are very creative. You want to be able to collaborate with teachers and support providers. A lot of times, dealing with these kids can be a very lonely experience because you're feeling like you're the only one dealing with them. But there are a lot of teachers out there, probably within the school, who are experiencing the same thing, and support providers. So you are able to find a goodness of fit with respect to support. Um, when we talk about making accommodations, we are talking about accommodations that facilitate learning for the student, not to facilitate the workload of the teacher. So it's very important that we don't take unnecessary shortcuts and mitigate the impacts of learned helplessness. What, is, what does learned and helplessness mean? So if you give up too easily and say, I can't do it, and the teacher says, oh, you know, they're there, you know, don't worry, you don't have to do it, right? I'm not saying torture the kid and, and, and put them through agony, but don't let them give up because that is a learned behavior that also multiplies exponentially. Um, if you look at these characteristics, okay, uh, do, are you all familiar with the concept of ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, and ADHD? Okay. Um, during the 1990s and early 2000s, ADD was very, very popular um, in the talk show circuit. Um, and it was uh, something that every parent feared their kid had or would get. Um, you know, uh, I have a nephew who was identified gifted, and he was eight years old, and um, his parents, I guess, had engaged in a lot of this sort of uh, talk show talk about uh, ADD and um, were somewhat uh, unnerved by it. 
and they were called into a parent-teacher conference, and the teacher said uh, to the parents, you know, Greg is a really nice boy. He is a super helper, and you know, everything that comes after that is going to be bad news. And basically what the teacher said is, you know, he's a great kid, but he's really distracted. He talks a lot. He fidgets, okay? Now, remember, he's eight years old. That is normal behavior for an eight-year-old boy. He talks a lot. He socializes. Um, I see him and the other kids. They're always playing outside. Uh, you know, they get into everything, they touch everything, they never wash their hands, so I think he probably picked up the ADD outside. So, I think you better take him to the doctor and, uh, you know, figure this out. So, basically, what, what the teacher was saying was, this is a kid who's a behavior problem and um, I don't, you know, want to manage it. So, like any good parents, they drag the, the kid off to the general practitioner and they say, you know, this kid never washes his hands. Uh, he's into everything, and we think, um, you know, he probably caught ADD from one of the others. Doctor said, oh, ADD, uh, okay. Pulls out the DSM-4, whatever they were looking, looked it up, ADD, ADD. Um, does he talk a lot? Uh-huh. Uh, is he fidgety? Uh-huh. Okay. So a general checklist, yep, he's got it. Uh, he got it pretty bad, probably had it for a while. So I'm going to write you a prescription for something called Ritalin. Okay, what's Ritalin? It's a stimulant, okay? Ritalin is a stimulant that um, college kids love um, because it keeps them up and it keeps them going um, when they need to do homework. But in general, Ritalin is a stimulant. And if you are your body chemistry is not suited to it, what are the two possible outcomes of taking a stimulant like Ritalin? You speed up or you fold in on yourself and, and you, it has the opposite effect. Well, the, the latter thing happened um, to my nephew. So he went from being sort of a boisterous, happy, social kid to wandering around the playground by himself with his head down. Lesson here is that if you suspect that sort of a learning disability, and this is not to say that it doesn't exist, go to a specialist. There are specific batteries that they will run uh, to test uh, task persistence versus sort of saying, yep, 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 yep. So I'm going to ask you, based on what you see here, we're going to do what's called a differential diagnosis. Based on what you see here, is this somebody who is ADD, or is this perhaps somebody who is gifted? Underachieving. Gifted. So you wouldn't encounter somebody with ADHD who is underachieving? Okay, so you wouldn't? You would. Okay, so it, it could be either. How about angry and frustrated? Okay, now this is going to be one or the other. So there's no, like, it's not a trick. Okay? High energy, intensive, fidgety, impulsive. Gifted? Okay. Well, no. It could be both. Could be both. Um, individualistic, non-conforming, and stubborn. Both? Okay. All right, I'm just letting you know we're about halfway down this list and everybody's saying both still. Disorganized, sloppy, poor handwriting. I don't think anybody handwrites anymore, but <laughs> both. Okay. All right, forgetful, absent-minded, daydreaming, both. Emotional and moody, both. Low interest in details. Okay, so basically we've got to the end of the list with no conclusion, okay? This could be the symptomology of a kid. This could actually be the symptomology of a 48-year-old male who's been sitting in traffic for the last two hours. But the answer here is gifted because what is missing is just as important as is what is there. And what's missing is task persistence. And that would be the thing to, to take a look at. Um, you will see kids who have ADHD. You will see gifted kids with autism. 
But you will also see gifted kids with Asperger's, which is a, a fairly um, uh, you know, uh, popular diagnosis. Um, when, you, uh, when you look at gifted kids with Asperger's, you will see repetitive motor mannerisms, unusual and passionate interests in topics, trouble forming relationships, appearing to lack enjoyment in situations where you should be enjoying yourself, avoiding direct eye contact, monotonous speech patterns, appearing to lack empathy, and unable to engage in small talk. Doesn't mean you're not gifted, but this is one example of what twice exceptionality looks like. So what can parents do? By law, twice exceptional kids have to be served in different ways. They can't be lumped into either learning disabled or gifted. There are very specific remedies. So one of the things that you are going to want to know if you suspect you're the parent of a twice exceptional kid or a diagnosed twice exceptional kid is you want to understand the law and your rights and responsibilities therein. As I said, I'm going to send a um, resource list uh, to the department. And uh, within that resource list, there's a phenomenal um, site called Rights Law, where it will outline exactly how you can expect to be served, what are your rights, what you should be able to ask for. Another thing that you should be able to do is understand that living day to day and hour to hour as a twice exceptional kid is tiring. It's physically and mentally exhausting and very frustrating. Even if they find success in certain things for a, a, a period of time, without issue. Every morning is a different day. You need to know what it's like to hit the wall. Do you know what I mean by hitting the wall? Um, runners use it um, you know, when it just feels like you can't go any further and when the smallest task appears just overwhelming and impossible. You know, um, imagine if you have agonized and agonized and struggled to write a paper in class and it comes back with a grade that you weren't expecting as somebody who's a perfectionist. Mentally and physically exhausting to the point where you say, isn't it better to not try and fail than it is to try and fail and be humiliated? Hitting the wall where even the simplest thing uh, feels impossible. You want to be able to work collaboratively with teachers and um, people here at school sites to make sure that the support that your kid is receiving is cohesive and consistent. I don't mean to be a helicopter parent. Are you guys familiar with the concept of helicopter parenting? What's a helicopter parent? Right. Well, helicopters hover, right? Do you know what the new thing is? Beyond helicopter, they've retired the helicopter parents. You know what the new parent is? No, no. It's the drone parent. The drone parent comes in unexpectedly and stealthily, destroys the place, and leaves. Right? Um, so you want to make sure that you're involved. Um, and the most important thing is that you want to make sure that what you're providing at home is consistent with what's being provided at school. So there is a sense of stability um, for the twice exceptional kid. Because gifted kids um, often feel as though their lives are chaotic and unstable. Twice exceptional kids feel that in more pronounced ways. Siblings. Siblings of twice exceptional kids also have it very hard. Because what you will find is that parents tend to direct all of their energies into supporting the twice exceptional kid. And often the other will feel left out or don't understand or, you know, here we were, we were ready to go to the baseball game and now we can't because, um, so you want to make sure you attend to their needs and make sure that they understand not only what's going on but that they're not any less important but what you're doing. Be empathetic and be honest. Um, know that a little love goes a very long way. 
to somebody who's suffering in silence, just knowing that you're there to be supportive no matter what uh, can do a lot. Um, you know, I think there's a tendency among a lot of parents of the gifted, once you find out that your kid is gifted, you want them to do everything. And one of the worst things you can do is pack their days so tightly with expectations that they could never live up to them. So just knowing that you're there, and no matter what they do, that you're there to support them, I mean, of course, within limits, um, goes a long way. Most important of all, take care of yourselves. It's exhausting to be a twice exceptional kid. It's exhausting to be a sibling of a twice exceptional kid. And the, the level of exhaustion, parenting both, is exhausting too. Realize your limits, right? Because not taking care of yourself is going to end up badly in the long run. So does that give you sort of an idea of what it's like? Are there any questions or comments that you have about? OK, we'll just go down the row. Yes, ma'am. Well, I know myself, myself, when I get really sad, like, I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, and and oh yes, oh absolutely. Okay, so the question was about um, other types of learning disabilities, specifically dyslexia, um, and um, the sort of frustration with the school system, um, and and other elements about um, attending to the needs of the dyslexic gifted learner. Now, within the body of the presentation. Um, I focused on ADHD and Asperger's because that is the sort of the most common thing that, that you will see in this world and um, also the, the more subtle. Um, but that is not to say that uh, the dyslexic gifted is, is not just as important or warrants just as much attention. I think that, that school systems generally have a hard time understanding. They will go to either place. So they'll focus on the dyslexia without attending to the giftedness. Or they'll focus on the giftedness with sort of marginalizing the dyslexia. So the important thing is to understand that both things have to be served simultaneously. So when you look at the dyslexic gifted kid, what you want to be able to do is focus on their particular strengths and build from there while still attending to the, the issues that and, and elements that are brought up by dyslexia and perhaps presenting things in a certain way or adjusting content in a certain way so the giftedness can shine through, right? So the idea isn't to say there you value one over the other. It is to say dyslexia and giftedness in the, is the context in which the kids exist and we have to focus on their strengths and then attend to the other at the same time simultaneously. It's very difficult to do that because most teachers, most educators don't have that kind of training. Sure. Okay. Okay. So for, for the audience at home, um, I want to make sure uh, that uh, the statement is, is, is clarified, um, is that the, the education system, the, the State Department of Education, I believe, or was it? Uh, the federal government um, said there, there is no reason to skirt around using the term dyslexia and couching it and in other issues such as writing difficulties or reading difficulties, but really focusing on dyslexia as a proper learning disability that needs to be addressed in its own right, and that there are resources. And the law says that you are entitled to access those resources. 
I think that there are not a lot of specialists. Uh, there are not a lot of specialists in gifted and talented education. There are more specialists in special education, but special education is a broad spectrum where most you will find are live in the world of mild to moderate um, cognitive versus specialty disorders. So it's almost like looking for a needle in a haystack. That is not to say that these kids should not be served or should be served in a marginal way. It's, there's just not a lot of expertise out there. So. And that that could be that could be the case. Um, I do yes, yes. Well, I'm I'm thinking about the question as I'm I'm repeating it. The question, the question was what is used by the district um, at at different times? Uh, is it the COGAT, which is the test of cognitive abilities, or is it the Ravens? And I I know that the Ravens is used at certain points as a nonverbal battery. It uh, I beg your pardon. Second and third grade, and then the, the COGAT as well, both of which are nonverbal um, sort of state of the art tests to identify. Again, you can imagine that even those types of assessments um, are not sufficiently sophisticated to pick up these nuances and subtleties, especially if you have a learning disability and a giftedness that will cancel each other out. You may not see it even in a nonverbal battery. So again, the idea here is with unlimited resources and unlimited time and unlimited patience, you can identify everybody with everything. But you know, it, it's, it's a struggle. And I know one thing I can certainly tell you is that the district, um, with, under Hoodie Chalian's leadership and the leadership of her administrative team, is looking at the whole identification process and overhauling it um, to, to, to make sure it is one that um, diagnoses and identifies with greater precision to the extent that's possible. So that is something that is happening. Absolutely. That is why, that is why this is, what you are looking at when you look at twice exceptionality you know, giftedness in itself is hard enough. Learning disability is hard enough. There are no checklists that you can go, yep, 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 yep. Now, putting the two together complicates things logarithmically because there's, there's shades, uh, you know, things aren't black and white. Um, so you can think of almost any conceivable situation where it'd be difficult to identify giftedness or learning disabled or both. We're making strides in the area, but again, it, it's, it's fluid and it can be chaotic. Other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. You know, it, it really, you know, it really depends because I think there, you know, when you're dealing with twice exceptionality, there's no sort of magic recipe or magic bullet. Um, you know, it could be a matter of um, focusing those sort of organizational skills, um, those spelling skills and writing skills in an area of focused interest. So writing and spelling is less laborious and less of a torture session when you're doing it with something you like. So, um, you know, uh, for example, I, uh, uh, thinking of myself here, I used to just uh, hate to write, but when I was given a topic that I could engage in or where I didn't feel, you know, where I felt as though I had some degree of expertise and wouldn't be harshly criticized, I took the risk to do it because it was something I was passionate about. So one of the things you can do is look at accommodations 
to focus on area of interest. Another thing that you want to do is you want to discover what the areas of strength within her giftedness are. And you want to use those as a conduit for writing and spelling. So she may be strong in creativity. So let her use her creativity in writing. So instead of writing about particular topics or you know, let, let her do free writes or let her do graphic organizers, which will help organize her thoughts a little bit. I mean, there are a number of accommodations, and the more that I would know about um, your, your specific case, um, you know, the more precise I can be. If you want to send me an email just sort of explaining your daughter a little bit, um, then I can send you something back, send you some resources and some ideas. Sure. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, and, and there are uh, lots of different types of anxiety. There's social anxiety, there's uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, there's post-traumatic stress, there is actual anxiety disorder, um, and it's the same thing. Now imagine if you're in an environment where you're experiencing a lot of pressure or there are um, you know, social norms that you have to attend to, having that kind of a situation as, as, uh, as a challenge. So you would want, to, what we know about learning generally is the best place, the best learning environment is one that is high challenge and low threat. And what we find in most uh, classrooms, it's just the opposite. High threat and you know, low challenge. So what you want to be able to do is to provide an environment for somebody who's experiencing anxiety, um, a physical environment and a social environment, which will mitigate the factors that might serve as catalysts for anxiety. So if somebody has a social anxiety, the way to bring out the creativity in them is not to keep selecting them and saying, OK, well, what do you think? What do you think? Because that's just going to make it worse. Again, the idea is to find this sort of perfect fit. And again, without really knowing what type of anxiety that we're talking about, because there is, I mean, it can go from mild to, to intense um, and manifest symptoms that feel like heart attacks. You know, So it really depends, and it depends on what the triggers are. So the idea is to provide a physical and learning environment that mitigates the impacts of triggers or where the triggers are non-existent, and to have the teacher watch for signs, because you can tell when anxiety is coming on, and then uh, intervene. Oh, before you, before, before you go on, let me, I, I forgot to repeat the question, and I'm going to probably get in a lot of trouble with the network. So. Um, the, the question was uh, regarding, related to anxiety, um, and what do you do in cases of anxiety, and we talked about you know, different types of anxiety and what the triggers are. Um, and now we're talking about a resource that's available for parents. Please go ahead. So some of the resources that are being presented here are the importance of sleep. Um, physiologically, um, the importance of sleep uh, cannot be overstated uh, because that is the time when the brain shuts down to process all the stimulants that it's been getting all day and to make sense of the day. So sleep is very, very important, especially for kids. Um, also, toning down the emotional volume of the, um, the home environment um, because it can be anxious and panicked enough, so making sure things are at a low ebb, and then um, not watching um, f 
frightening movies or um, movies that are likely, or TV that's likely to frighten like uh, Real Housewives and, and things like that, um, you know, that also serve to uh, sort of mitigate those impacts. So a very good resource, thank you. Anything else for the good of the cause, for the good of the room? Um, I want to give you my contact information. Um, in the event uh, that you do need directed support, and directed assistance, um, I can make myself available to you. And I offer my contact information because there are no magic solutions. There's not one, you know, anybody go to a baseball game and get a one-size-fits-all shirt? Does it fit? One size fits all and fits no one. So if you have specific questions or concerns um, that, that you would like me to address, please just send me a quick email and, and uh, give me as much a detail as you can. Um, I will also be sending up a, a listing of resources um, to the office here that can be distributed for your use, sort of general use. Um, one place that you definitely want to go is a place called Hoagies, H-O-A-G-I-E-S. I guess like the sandwich, I, I don't know why it's called Hoagies, um, but it is a resource for parents uh, and teachers of the gifted and talented, and they have a wonderful section on twice exceptionality, a huge section um, with all sorts of uh, resources. So please do go there. The, the question that was asked, is there a test um, for dyslexia that can be delivered uh, as early as first grade, much like the tests that are used to identify gifted um, and learning disabilities, um, and that could be easily distributed? More than likely, there is something like that that exists. I don't know how widely in use that it is. One thing to understand is that um, Testing companies don't do things out of the goodness of their hearts. These types of assessments tend to be very, very expensive, and districts sort of have to make decisions about um, what they select and what they use. Chances are there is somebody's developed something that can be good for universal use. Send me an email with a question, and I can do some research. I bet that there's something out there. I don't know how widely used it is, though, because you can imagine the, the litany of entrance exams uh, for kids. But send me an email. I can look into that for you. But again, I do thank you for your kind attention. Please drive safely home. And if you need me, you know where to find me. Thank you.